Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing the acute inflammatory response and anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay, so we've so far discussed type 1 activation of endothelial cells, which is a type of activation which occurs very quickly on um, the endothelial cells, okay? And it's induced by uh, ligands such as histamine, and also we've seen bradykinin and calidin will also induce it. Okay, and uh, it results in, firstly, the endothelial cells producing nitric oxide and prostacyclin, which will cause vasodilatation of the terminal arterioles in the, uh, that supply the local area. Okay, it will also cause endothelial cell contraction, which will open up spaces between neighboring endothelial cells, which will allow the formation of an inflammatory exudate. And finally, it also uh, results in P-selectin and platelet activating factor being exposed on these endothelial cells, and this begins uh, the process of neutrophil recruitment from the bloodstream into the interstitial fluid. Okay, so... Uh, we're now going to look at type 2 activation, which takes longer and is induced in endothelial cells by ligands such as interleukin-1 uh, and uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha. Okay, so we're going to have a look at the pathways uh, by which interleukin-1 and tumor necrosis factor alpha induce uh, the uh, type 1 activation within the endothelial cells. Okay, so we start off with... Uh, we'll start off with interleukin-1. Okay, so let's say this represents the interleukin-1 type 1 receptor. Okay, so on the uh, basolateral membranes of these endothelial cells, you will have type 1 interleukin-1 receptors. Okay, now uh, these are often abbreviated to... Uh, interleukin-1, so IL-1, and then R1, okay, so it will often be abbreviated to IL-1 for interleukin-1, and then you put an R for receptor, and then you put a 1 after the R to denote that this is the type 1 interleukin-1 receptor. Okay, so we'll colour in this type 1 interleukin-1 receptor in blue here, okay, so What's going to happen is when the uh, resident macrophages and the dendritic cells release interleukin-1 uh, up, upon um, having their pattern recognition receptors activated by uh, pathogen-associated molecular patterns, uh, they are going to start um, producing the interleukin-1 and it will diffuse over to the endothelial cells. It will bind to these type 1 interleukin-1 receptors on the surface of the endothelial cells. So let's have the interleukin-1 here. Okay, so this represents the interleukin-1. And now this triggers activation of this type 1 interleukin-1 receptor. And once the uh, type 1 interleukin-1 receptor is activated, it's going to associate with two proteins that are in the cytoplasm, or rather, two proteins that are usually in the cytoplasm are going to come and bind to the intracellular domain of this interleukin-1 receptor. Okay, so these two proteins then, so let's draw them, uh, we'll draw them here. Okay, so I'll draw a rectangle and I'll split it into two. Okay, so we'll start with this one on the Right. Okay, so this is a protein that is often called TIRAP. Okay, now TIRAP stands for the Toll slash interleukin 1 receptor uh, accessory protein. So this stands for the Toll, so Toll is for the T there. Then it's interleukin 1, which is the I, so TI is for Toll forward slash interleukin 1. And then the R is for receptor. Okay, and then the A is for accessory, and then the P for protein. So this is the toll slash interleukin-1 receptor accessory protein, or TIRAP for short. Okay, so let's colour in TIRAP in purple here. Okay, now the other protein is a very famous protein. Okay, um, so the next protein over here and I want to make sure that I leave space for the things that we're going to put below, uh, is what's known as the myeloid differentiation 
primary response gene 88. Okay, so this is the myeloid differentiation primary response gene 88. Okay, oh, oops, differentiation. And now we're getting right into the space where I want to draw things afterwards. Um, never mind. Myeloid differentiation primary... I just have to squeeze things in. Response gene 88. Okay, now this is abbreviated. Um, so you won't usually hear it referred to in full as the myeloid differentiation primary response gene 88. Instead, you'll usually just see this referred to as MY for myeloid, then a capital D for differentiation, and then 88. So MYD88, and that is uh, something that if you've studied immunology, you will most likely have heard of before, MYD88. Okay, so we'll have MYD88 in turquoise here. Okay, so now that you've got these two proteins associated with the intracellular aspect of the activated type 1 interleukin 1 receptor, uh, what's going to happen is that two more proteins are going to come and associate now with uh, the MYD88, okay, and that's why this word being so long is a little annoying, because I want to now draw two proteins attaching to um, MYD88, so I'll have to draw them like this kind of thing, so they're both attaching to MYD88. Okay, so what are these two proteins? Okay, well, one, let's say this one here, is going to be something known as IRAC1, I-R-A-K-1. Okay, now this stands for the interleukin-1 receptor associated kinase 1. So the interleukin-1, that's the I, and then receptor is the R, and then the A-K is for associated kinase. So this is the interleukin-1 receptor associated kinase 1, or IRAC1. Now, the other protein over here, this is IRAC4. So this is the interleukin-1 receptor associated kinase 4. Okay, so I'll color code them. So we'll have, uh, what colors haven't we used yet? We haven't used orange. So we'll have IRAC1 in orange, the interleukin-1 receptor associated kinase 1, which has attached onto the MYD88 uh, uh, protein. Okay, and then we'll have uh, IRAC4, which we'll have in pink here, okay, the uh, interleukin-1 receptor associated kinase 4, we'll have that in pink, so I'll underline it as well in pink there. Okay, so the final protein that's going to associate on here is uh, a protein known as TRAF6, okay, so I'll put this, and it's going to specifically bind onto uh, this IRAC one that we had here, this interleukin-1 receptor associated kinase 1, okay? And this protein, where should I put its name? I'll put it here. Okay, this is known as TRAF6, okay? And TRAF6 stands for the tumor necrosis factor receptor associated factor 6. So this is the tumor necrosis factor, which I'll just abbreviate to TNF, and then the R is for receptor, and then the A is for associated, and then the F for factor. So this is the tumor necrosis receptor, uh, sorry, the tumor necrosis factor receptor associated uh, factor 6, TRAF6. Okay, so we'll have TRAF6 in turquoise again. In fact, no, I'll put it in yellow. We haven't used yellow. Okay, so in yellow here, this is TRAF6, which is associated specifically with IRAC1, which was associated with the MYD88. Okay, now, this whole structure that you are forming within the uh, endothelial cell is what's known as a signalosome. Okay, so this entire complex is called a signalosome. Okay. And it's going to lead to the activation of certain transcription factors. Okay, so one of the transcription factors it's going to lead to the activation of is NF-kappa-B. And it's an, the normal, most common form of NF-kappa-B. So, let's introduce NF-kappa-B. Okay, so NF-kappa-B, which stands for Nuclear Factor Kappa-B. Now, there are multiple 
nuclear factor kappa b. So it's not a single uh, protein complex, basically. It's not a single transcription factor. There are multiple nuclear factor kappa b's. However, the main one is the one that's going to be activated in um, this pathway. So when people talk about NF kappa b, they usually mean a dimer of two proteins. Okay, so they mean a dimer of two proteins known as P50, okay, and also P65. So these two proteins, P50 and P65, they dimerize together, and this dimer is a very powerful transcription factor, and this is what people usually mean when they refer to uh, nuclear factor kappa B. There are others, but this is the main one. Okay, so P50 and P65. Now you have P50 and P65 all dimerized together and already in the cytoplasm of the cell. So this transcription factor is already made, basically. However, it is kept within the cytoplasm of the cell, uh, which is useless because it needs to go to the nucleus uh, if it's going to actually work as a transcription factor. It needs to go to where the DNA is. And um, it's kept in the cytoplasm by being bound to a protein known as the inhibitor of the nuclear factor kappa B. And again, there isn't just one inhibitor of the nuclear factor kappa B. There are many, uh, but we'll just keep it general, and they all do the same thing after all, so we'll uh, just refer to this as an, in an inhibitor of NF kappa B. So this stands for an inhibitor of NF kappa B, the nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, so that for short, that's denoted as inhibitor I and then of kappa B, basically. Okay, so that would be read, however, as the inhibitor of the nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, so basically these P50, P65 dimers, which is the nuclear factor kappa B, they are usually kept within the cytoplasm because they have this protein, which is an inhibitor of NF kappa B, bound to it. And there are multiple examples of inhibitor, uh, inhibitor of NF kappa B proteins, uh, but we'll just keep it general because they all do effectively the same thing. Okay, now, if you want to activate the P50, P65 uh, dimer, uh, if you want to activate NF kappa B, you have to inactivate uh, the inhibitor of NF kappa B. Okay, now what's going to happen is that TRAF6 is going to activate a whole bunch of proteins in a great cascade. So it's not going to do this directly, but it's going to lead to a cascade, which does then lead to the inactivation of this inhibitor of NF kappa B. So what's going to happen is that firstly you're going to end up phosphorylating this inhibitor of NF kappa B. Now when you phosphorylate it, that does not, I repeat, it does not cause the dissociation of the inhibitor of NF kappa B from uh, the NF kappa B. So at the moment we just phosphorylated it, but that hasn't done anything basically. Okay, what then happens is the phosphorylation leads to it being ubiquitinated, so it gets ubiquitin groups stuck onto it. So here, whoops, this is a ubiquitin group that's being now stuck on the side of this inhibitor of NF kappa B. Okay, so the phosphorylation leads to uh, the ubiquitination, which means adding ubiquitin groups uh, onto the protein, okay? Uh, so, once you've added ubiquitin groups onto the inhibitor of NF kappa B protein, then it still does not cause the dissociation of the inhibitor of NF kappa B from uh, the NF kappa B transcription factor. So, what now happens, however, is that the ubiquitin group targets this um, inhibitor of NF kappa B for proteasomal destruction. So the proteasome is quite a formidable thing in the world of proteins, okay? It's a tube that proteins go in one side and uh, fragments of proteins come out the other side. So here is our proteasome, okay? And what's going to happen is that the inhibitor of NF kappa B is going to bind to the entrance to the proteasome because it's got its ubiquitin group stuck on the side of it. And uh, so let's draw this happening. So here is our inhibitor of the nuclear factor kappa B, I kappa B. 
and then it's got this ubiquitin group which is now bound to the entrance to the proteasome here so let's put that in blue as it was previously okay and it still has its phosphate group on which I will now draw over here simply because there's not really space to put it there okay which remember what that phosphate group did it allowed it to be ubiquitinated so the inhibitor of NF kappa B couldn't be ubiquitinated until you had that phosphate group putting on put on okay and then here still is the P50 and the P65 proteins which are still dimerized together and still bound to the inhibitor of the nuclear factor kappa B now, what's going to happen is that the inhibitor of NF-kappa B is going to be unwound and it's going to be fed through the proteasome and gradually destroyed. Okay, now you might think, why well, isn't there a risk that the P50 and the P65 are just pulled through? Well, they don't get pulled through. As the inhibitor of NF-kappa B is gradually destroyed, it's gradually pulled apart, basically, and fed through this uh, proteasome. So what will happen is you'll grab onto an end of the um, polypeptide and you'll just gradually unwind uh, the inhibitor of NF-kappa B, uh, unfold it and just feed the polypeptide through and break it up. So this protein will be gradually dismantling basically. Uh, that will just eventually lead to the P50 and P65 dissociating off. Okay, so once we have ubiquitinated the inhibitor of NF-kappa B, it then leads to the destruction of the inhibitor of NF-kappa B by the proteasome and that then leads to uh, this NF-kappa B being released into the cytoplasm of the cell. So just to reiterate, the TRAF6 protein is not directly going to phosphorylate the inhibitor of NF-kappa B but it will lead to the activation of a kinase which will phosphorylate the inhibitor of NF-kappa B uh, which will lead to its ubiquitination and uh, that will then lead to the uh, freeing of this NF-kappa B transcription factor down here. So you're going to activate the NF-kappa B transcription factor. Okay, now before we just discuss what NF-kappa B is going to do, uh, let's also discuss the fact that TRAF6 leads to the activation of another transcription factor as well. So it's also going to lead to the activation of a transcription factor known as the activator protein complex 1, or AP1. So AP1 is a dimer, basically, of two separate proteins, and it's known as the activator protein 1. And it's, again, another very powerful transcription factor which is going to be activated by the TRAF6. So, so far, the result of um, interleukin-1 binding to the interleukin-1 receptor is that we have the activation of these two transcription factors, NF-kappa B and activator protein 1. Okay, now before we discuss what these do, let's look at the pathway for tumor necrosis factor alpha because again the pathway for tumor necrosis factor alpha is going to activate these exact same two transcription factors but it's going to do it for a different signalosome okay so we'll discuss the tumor necrosis factor alpha pathway and then we'll combine the two pathways together and discuss how uh, these two transcription factors nf kappa b and activator protein one are going to cause type 2 activation of the endothelial cells. Okay, but we'll look at tumor necrosis factor alpha in the next video.